Would you pray with me? God, our Heavenly Father, when we look at our world today, when we look at our own communities, it's far too often we see people, we, we, we even see ourselves being torn apart. And I don't see what you see, but God, we're asking for clearer vision. We're, we want to open our hearts to whatever it is that we need to pay attention to, to things that need to change in us, to ways that we need to change the way we live in our community to reflect your grace and your goodness, your love. And so God, we pray to you for peace. And we also pray that he falls like lightning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome you to Cedar Creek. Whatever campus you're at, if you're watching online, thanks for giving us a few minutes to step into what I believe is an important topic today. If you're wondering what that line means in the song, praying to God that he falls like lightning, the songwriters were referencing a story where Jesus, in Luke chapter 10, sends out 72 of his followers, sending them out into Galilee, saying, hey, will you go and proclaim that God's kingdom has arrived? Invite people into the work that God is doing to be a part of God's family. Push back against the hopelessness, the helplessness that evil has created in our world. And they do. 72 go out all across Israel. And when they come back, they're celebrating the ways that God and his grace and his goodness showed up. And Jesus says, I saw Satan falling like lightning to kind of capture the significance of that moment. I believe that division is Satan's favorite tool. If you think about the word division, die, dual, split vision, he's, he's splitting the vision of our families, of our marriages, of our neighborhoods, our communities, our country, our world, our own hearts. Satan, the liar, the slanderer is at work today. And just like with the 72, I believe Jesus is inviting you and me to go into our community to be a part of the story that he's writing. And there's incredible power when we move forward united against what Satan is trying to divide. And so we talked about this last week. The way that we do that is we got to let our common unity help us with our complex differences. We got to put in our closed hand what Jesus invites us to put in our closed hand to help us navigate what is very complicated, what seldom comes with easy solutions, and today's subject is complicated for sure. When you start to talk about race and racism, it's a hot button issue. <laughs> I don't know about you, but some of you, you can already feel the tension, the, the, a bit of the, uh, the internal work, you know, the anxiety. I feel it trying to talk about it. I know what some people, maybe some of you are saying is like, oh, here we go, okay. Seems to be the popular thing that all these woke millennials are talking about. And so here's another white pastor feeling like he has to talk to some culturally relevant subject. Or maybe others of you, it's a holy discontent. It's like, we're not talking about it enough. We need to be doing more. Can we, can we for a minute acknowledge that we're all coming to this conversation, this very complicated conversation from different perspectives and let me just speak back to you what our hope is, part of our value here at Cedar Creek, is we want to create a safe place. We believe that the church should be the safest place on the planet to talk about anything. There are far too many subjects that aren't talked about here, and church should be a safe place for you to talk about your struggles, for us to talk about this. That does not mean comfortable. It means safe. And so wherever you're at, if this is your first time, my name's Ben. I'm so glad that you're here. I love it that we can connect this way, not just on the weekend, but throughout the, the week in our rebroadcast online. In fact, we have a special group that joins us every week from TOCI, the men at Toledo Correctional. Will you put your hands together just to tell them we see them, we're thankful for them, love them, praying for them. 
My goal, our goal over the next few minutes is not for me to share with you my perspective on the issue, my thoughts. And the truth is, if you talk to my, my, my family and the team, my thoughts kind of swirl all around the place. I feel like I'm learning like you are learning. Our goal is to really look at what is Jesus inviting us into. If Jesus is our common unity, how is he helping us navigate this very complex issue? And the first century pastor paints a powerful picture of what Jesus came to accomplish. I want to look at that together. In Ephesians 2, it says, Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separates us. Jesus himself, not Jesus and a bunch of other things, Jesus himself brought peace to us. In some translations, it says that he is our peace. And so what he did is he united Jews and Gentiles, which may not mean a whole lot to you and me. I mean, most of us are not Jewish, and even if we are Jewish, we don't, it's not common to hear that term Gentiles. But back in Jesus' day, for many years, thousands of years, Jews viewed themselves as God's chosen people. Many of them still do today, but in the ancient church, first century church, Jewish people referred to all non-Jewish people as Gentiles. It was a way of categorizing us versus them, those who are in the family and those who are out of the family. In fact, they had another term that they loved to use a lot called uncircumcised, those uncircumcised people. Think about it. (laughs) That's a medical term for us today, but anytime you use male anatomy to describe someone, that typically typically isn't a compliment, okay? We don't compliment people that way today. The Jews certainly didn't mean that in a compliment back in those days either. They were totally fine being insensitive to all of those outside of the church people. They hated each other. They called each other unclean or, or all, I mean, all sorts of terms, back and forth. It was ugly. I mean, you think we're dealing with tension and injustices today. It was worse back then, not giving a pass on what's happening today. I'm just setting the stage for this environment because what we are too far removed from is the incredible complexity that the first century church had. You have people who grew up Jewish and believed in all of the diet and cultural things that come with that, And you have all of these non-Jewish Gentile individuals who grew up a completely different way trying to worship the same Jesus together. And so this first century pastor, in the midst of this incredibly divisive time, you don't, you don't care all of this stuff. It says that he united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us, the, the hatred, the, the angst, the, the different, he broke it down so that two different groups of people could become one. He broke through the barriers that divide us. I wanna talk about four barriers today that if we're not careful, will continue to divide us. The first one is pride, second one is fear, third one's hurt, and the fourth one is hopelessness. Let's take them one by one. These are the things These are the things that ultimately make it difficult for us to talk about our complex differences. Pride, I think we all know what that is. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm better than you are. Pride shows up in very aggressive attacking terms and also very defensive terms as well or reactions. Pride tends to exaggerate my goodness and exaggerate your badness, okay? So this is how, you know what's amazing? Maybe you're better at this than I am, but it's, it's hard for me to see pride in me. It's hard for most of us, I think, for us to see. We don't, we just, oh no, I, I didn't mean that. But it's really easy to see it and sense it in other people. I mean, you just listen to the way some people talk. You're like, wow, they're really into themselves. That's amazing. And then the truth is pride leaves us divided. Why? Because I, want it, I need to be better than you. You need to be better than me. Second one is fear. Fear is this uncertainty, this angstiness that we have. I'm afraid that I may say it wrong. I'm afraid of what they may say. I'm afraid of what they may do. And so what do we do? We build a wall. We build up an an emotional wall to keep that threat away from us. It's safer to be silent. And so we don't say anything. You know, we're not going to rock the boat. And what we end up doing is living in assumptions about what's happening on the other side of that wall or what what those people, we we don't really learn. We just stay divided because it's not, we're too afraid of all of the consequences. Another thing that keeps us divided is hurt. And this is challenging because this means you've been wounded or they've been wounded. There's a real hurt, something, some injustice or some 
bad thing has happened. And what tends to happen is what a few someones do becomes all of those someones. And then we end up carrying this hurt that we want to take care of. So what do we do? We build a wall to try to comfort, heal our hurt. But too often that hurt turns into bitterness and it just leaves us divided. The last one is hopelessness. And it's like, what's the point? I mean, it's always been around. We don't even know. I don't even know what to say. I don't know enough about it. It's too complicated for me. And so each of these things separate us. Each of these things divide. And at the root of racism, bias, prejudice, and really all of the division that we face, it can probably come down to one or more of these, three th- these four things. And what it leaves us, the way that it leaves us operating in our world is who's in versus who's out. People who are in, I want them to be like me. I want them to help me feel better about myself. We re- reinforce our pride. I want them to help keep fear and uncertainty away. So they gotta value the walls that I built. I don't want them to hurt me. If they hurt, if they accuse, then you're out and you're no longer in. And so this is the way that we go. And if you perpetuate this sense of hopelessness that makes me feel uncomfortable, or if you call me out on that, I'm just going to push you further and further away, which leaves an us versus them mentality divided. And we stay here. Jesus shows up and wants to push us out of the barriers that we've created between us and them, whoever they are, to experience something different. Why? Because together, not divided, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. So Jesus accomplished something that helps our hostility towards each other be put to death. Jesus does something to reconcile. What does it mean to reconcile? To bring back into harmony. So when we put Jesus in our closed hand, If we call ourselves Jesus followers, and I know not all of you are there yet in your spiritual journey, but as Jesus followers, when we put his work in our closed hand, it means we are invited to set down our pride, move beyond our fear, begin to experience healing to our hurt, step out of our hopelessness and talk about these complicated issues. And so I took a step towards that this week. Just another one. Some of you have seen me do this before. I just gathered some people around to talk about very complicated things. And I know we don't all agree on all of the things around the table, but I wanted us to sit down and go, okay, let's just step into it. And I want to model what it looks like to listen and to learn, even if I don't agree with or still have questions about some of the nuances. So I invited Diana Patton, good friend of mine. These are friends, so that kind of sets the table to my, our advantage anyway. But she's the founder and CEO of the RISE program. She's a motivational speaker, social justice advocate, author, attorney, consultant. She's been around Cedar Creek for years. And I appreciate her perspective on how she helps, wants to help increase healthy dialogue around these complicated issues. I also invited Reverend John Jones, president of Hope Toledo, helping students from pre-K to post-secondary get better educational opportunities, specifically with the um, Scott High School. Uh, He was a formerly the officer of diversity and inclusion at uh, Prometica. He's an associate minister at Christian Temple Baptist. So for those of you that are part of that church, if you're watching, thanks for letting us spend some time with John. We appreciate him. And then Will Richardson is a state highway patrolman for over 30 years. He's a Celebrate Recovery leader at our West Toledo campus and a part of our team out there. And so here's a disclaimer because we live in an era of disclaimers. These individuals are speaking on behalf of themselves. They're not speaking on behalf of an organization, myself included. We just got around the table to ask some questions and we don't all agree. You probably are not going to agree on every single thing that's talked about, but we had a common unity in Jesus that helps us begin to process these very complicated issues. So I want you to experience it. Let's watch. Um, We're just going to dive right in. Have you personally experienced any racial tension or racism in your life? Yes. (laughs) Really? Yes. (laughs) You know, I mean, growing up for me, I had, you know, a white father and a black mom. So the tension of race was compounded because I didn't fit neatly into just the African-American race or white. Race has always been a part of my narrative and racism, absolutely. Not only just racism, but sexism as being a, a female corporate 
uh, person. So absolutely. Yeah, I, I would say yes, um, totally and completely. Um, and it shows itself in different ways. So having grown up um, in a historical African-American black church in the heart of the hood, grandmother's was our first pastor dad is now my pastor but then going to school in a predominantly white um, school I've learned and had to learn that racism comes in different ways from folks that you wouldn't really expect it from and then how do you learn to deal with that and then then leaving that school to go to a historically black college and university having went to an all white K to 12 experience it's an amazing experience, uh, but it, sh it has shaped the God that I am today. Yeah. Yeah, similarly, um, I was just me and my mom growing up in inner city. And when I was about nine, I got jumped twice by a gang. And so my mom, uh, being a child of a product of the 60s and, and the civil rights movement and everything else, she stepped out of her comfort zone and took me to an all white community where it went from I'm getting jumped here by you know, by gangs, and I go to an all-white school, and I'm the only black kid there, and it was like Mach 10, um, being chased through the halls with, you know, pay, uh, 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 construction paper, you know, clan hats. I'm driving, walking down the street, and people run up and, uh, you know, yell the you know N words, whatever. You know, they chase me in their car. I mean, all those things. People I thought were my friends would. I would make them mad or something on the football team and they yell, you know, yo, trigger word, you know, and yeah. that I, I, and they molded me to be just, just be pleasant to everybody. I, and my thought as a young kid trying to survive was if I just nice to people, they'll be nice to me. Yeah, so in some ways, your childhood experiences f um, shaped or played a role in shaping the people that you became today. Not saying that they're acceptable, not saying that they're good. Uh, but I think that's true for all of us. I would say I don't know that I have ever personally experienced racism. So do you think white people can experience racism in our world today? I told you, we're going right in. So you dive in deep fast. Um, I, th I think that is an excellent question. And I think it's a question that has to be addressed and dealt with because I hear regularly, especially now, that oh, racism goes both ways. Um, so if you were to unpack the conversation of race and unpack the conversation of racism, racism has to do with power. In that instance, more often than not, the dominant culture, white people, do not have to deal with, quote, racism because of the color of their skin and being a disabused of power. And so for me, it's a struggle. Now here's the flip is that me being president, I'll use this example, me being president of Hope Toledo, if I intentionally say I'm not hiring Ben because he's white, I executed power and could be defined as now having executed yeah. racism against you because I have the power and structure in this space to do that. Most often in America, that doesn't exist. So I'm gonna say back to you what I heard. Racism comes from a position or a seat of power when I choose or not choose someone based on their ethnicity, or I enact something for or against someone based purely on what well, we could say the color of their skin. Am I, am I saying that? Color is, that of skin. is that your perspective on that? that? that that's my perspective on it, absolutely. absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah, so that's how historically it's been in this country. I mean, this country was set up I mean, there's a lot of arguments about how this, we should view our history yep. or not view our history. And that has historically been the case. And so that's what racism is, is set up from that perspective. I, I was not gonna say this, but I think with, with the conversation and the way in which the tone and the tenor exist, um, we have to come to an understanding that race is a man-made concept biologically, genetically, all people on earth are 99% more alike than they are different. Absolutely. So if that is the case, 
right, that we're 99% more alike than we are different. The concept of race was created by man yeah. to then hold power and construct. So not to dig into a over whole, the over, over the one percent over the over the one percent that creates the That's difference right. right and so and so i would I, I would say this from this perspective so that as folks are listening to this when you really think about race being that there was a point in time where blonde haired blue eyed white people executed a level of quote racism against dark haired dark eyed white people yeah and so when you, when you start to unpack it and really look at that, it's really about power and control. And we have to think through that space and see how we live. And as a result of that, policies, procedures, laws, and, le and then attitudes and behaviors follow that methodology. Yep. And as a result, we are where we are. No, I actually, I mean, I, I agree with, with both your uh, concepts. Um, I'm a history buff. I love history. Um, I love American history. Um, and so, you know, when people came over, you know, escaping King George and all that stuff, and the reason, um, I always look at it that um, that the country still was founded on, on Christian values. For me, that is huge for me because that's, I mean, that's where my life is now. Um, and, you, and you said it perfectly. There were wrongs. <laughs> Over time, we continue to correct those wrongs. Now, some people want us to completely wipe the entire slate clean and start from zero. We can't do that. But I think we get so people get so caught up in the moment that they don't remember the strides that we have made, the steps that we've taken. Especially when you and I were were, were children, a lot better off now. Um, and I just see that God is this needs to be God is. In, in control, but Satan's having a field day right now. So when it comes to differences and your experiences, my experiences, why is it so difficult to talk about ethnic backgrounds, ethnic or racial differences? Pick the word that you want to put in there. Why is it difficult to broach the subject, especially with people who don't look or have the same skin color you do? And until we are willing to listen to understand a little bit of history, to understand not everybody has been treated the same. There's differences. And I'll be quite honest with you. Our country was built on Christian principles, but we haven't all been like Christ. We haven't been taking the uh, position where we're willing to get in, I'll quote John Lewis, good trouble, which is what Jesus did. Jesus got in good trouble. And he put himself out there for people who were the disenfranchised, Yep. who were people like myself. So why is it difficult to talk about race? Because no one really, really wants to get into challenging, courageous conversations about it. Let's just let it go. But we need to go in. We need to have, this is what Jesus did. Yeah. And until we're willing to recognize that, will we be able to talk about race? Hmm. My, from my perspective, um, I don't always hear the, we just want to keep it normal. My experience is not, and I have a limited perspective, is not like, oh, don't rock the boat. It's a, I don't know how to bring it up. I don't know how to ask. I don't know how to navigate that conversation without being quickly accused of saying it wrong, doing it wrong, picked up, canceled, tone deaf. I mean, there's a whole movement of phrases now even in this whole conversation, I'm, I'm among friends, you know? So, I mean, that makes it a lot easier. We have history together. How would you, how, how would you help equip me to step into those conversations? Because I think there's a movement of people who want to, but they're just like, I don't even know how to bring it up without offending somebody, without saying the wrong word. So one, let's not be naive. This conversation around race, race and reconciliation, I've talked with several pastors. Um, who have been in these conversations for the past 20 years, we still in the same spot. Um, and when I say the same spot, it's probably, you know, the heat of it yeah. is even worse, right? So George Floyd is murdered. My personal reaction to that was strong. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, was, it was a bit shocking to me. 
because I was like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, like, like this is real. Like eight minutes, 46 seconds of real. Mm-hmm. So everybody's coming around. How do we do this? How do we, how do we start to address this so on and so forth? And I started to see, and this was a concern for me, right? And I felt it because I felt like saying it every once in a while myself. You don't have the right to say something right now. Mm. And so God had to keep challenging me and talking to me about not letting the hurt that I feel allow me to become bitter. Mm -hmm. And so what I feel from many people who are saying, okay, if a person who is white says, hey, well, maybe we should do that, and it comes out wrong, like all wrong, <laughs> Ben, all wrong. What I fear is, is that people have used these moments to say, see, there you go. You don't get it. You ain't even trying. I feel that um, we as believers, because again, we need to talk about that, is that grace, humility, kindness, are supposed to be the tenets yeah. of a Christ follower. With that being said, we should be going into the world with that. Our human nature, however, oh, yeah. and our sinful nature, our sin nature yeah. will take over mm-hmm. and disallow us to come to a place of reconciliation. Yeah. The only place, you, only time you can get to reconciliation, number one, is first of all, acknowledge the problem. Yeah, and that's. That's where a lot of tension, that's yeah. why it's hard. Ign- when we can't acknowledge the problem, we can't get to reconciliation. Right. Get we have to, conf- as Christ followers, we're supposed to confess. Then we can start to have really good dialogue. And I agree with you. In the, when the George Floyd thing happened, I was sick. Yeah. I was so angry. As a, as a police officer, I know it's going to make it even worse for us to see that. You know, when I was in Cleveland, we had all of the different groups in Cleveland going back and forth each other, yelling and screaming. And, and it was only then when they started to talk, their anger level went down, and they were able to at least sit and watch so many times people walking away, shaking hands. They may not agree, you know, at the end of the day, you're to opposite sides, but nobody's willing to talk. They just want to shout. And that's why when I watch these young people yelling and screaming, I'm thinking, please. I wore this thing on purpose in my uniform. I wore this, and I had my heart just like this. So they could see that. They're like, God, please, let me. it could just reach one person in this group to say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? can't listen to you. Everybody has a cop and is a, fr- a friend who is a, who is a cop. Do you ever think to talk to ask them about their feelings and how they thought about things and how they see those things? Yeah. We, we've, we've had a long history and um, of that um, in our country of police brutality. And we've only seen a snippet of what historically I think a lot of people in this country have just woke up to this, oh, something's wrong. It's been wrong. And this is where the acknowledgement of the problem comes in, is that we've had this history for a long period of time. And um, we have some folks that have been in those, in the positions of, um, as police, who've, who've abused the power. I'm a lawyer. We have lawyers who abuse power. I'm a pastor. <laughs> We have yeah, pastors who abuse power. power. <laughs> so we've got to then acknowledge that problem. Yep. And that's what the, the protesting has been about. I live in a unique uh, tension where I want to mourn with those who mourn. Yep. And I think some of what we've seen on social media, some of the slogans that have come, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, is people mourning or caring about people, some of the things that are connected with that, police brutality, some of the uh, complaints against the organization that started Black Lives Matter has made the ability to show compassion to both sides very difficult. And I feel like what I'm hearing from you, and even what you've kind of demonstrated, is uh, 
we, I feel like oh, this is a takeaway for me that you all have helped reinforce. I like, I have to pay attention to my internal compassion meter. And when my compassion goes down and my internal hostility towards someone is starting to go up, it might not always be their fault first. Now, they may be the trigger for some of that, but man, my ability to see people as humans first, the 99% first, goes a long way in us being able to have a civil dialogue about things that are very real, very complicated. I mean, police, injustice, community, all of that stuff. Uh, if you guys have simple solutions, let's we'll put them, you know what I mean? It's like, that's just not gonna be an easy problem to solve. So we're, we have to talk about it, and we have to talk about it in ways where we see each other's humanity, we care about each other through it. The one thing I think we should all think about is, to, is the power of the pause. Mm -hmm. To pause and allow space for that God to come in and to assess what's going on in that space. There's just pa pausing and having space, a breath, taking a deep breath and praying and then speaking is a good practice. It's helping me in my marriage and it's helping me in my relationships and it's helping me because I wasn't always that way. There was no pausing. <laughs> I was speaking constantly and not allowing that time. Thanks so much, you guys, for taking time to share. And I saw a couple of times where we got into some stuff. I'm like, ooh, this will be fun to see how all this shakes. Um, but the work that you're doing, it matters. And it's a privilege to be serving our community, both for Christ, but also for the good of all people together. So thanks. It's been uh, fun for me. I, in fact, uh, some of the things that we talk about, we talked about, I'm in c continuing conversation going, hey, help me understand, because the more I think about some of that, uh, I, I just, I have more questions. If I'm not careful, you know, it can get a little probably exhausting for some people in the context of good friendship and ongoing care, it's great. And I imagine that some of you are sitting there right now going, well, what about, and insert your perspective. Or maybe you're sitting there going, I don't agree with one of the things that was said, or I didn't like that. Yeah, that seemed one-sided to me. Or that didn't even scratch the surface. I mean, here we are talking about stuff. You didn't even really get into anything, right? You didn't solve anything. And I understand all of that. But here's the thing. If Jesus is our peace, as Jesus followers, if he is the one that broke down the wall of hostility, if he is the one that said we need to love each other as he has loved us, do you know what moments like this remind all of us that I think we know, but sometimes is easy to forget? It reminds us that love is an easy talk and a challenging walk, all right? I know, it's like you know that in your marriage, you know that with your kids, you know that with your family members, and it's certainly true here, especially when we don't see things the same way, when we disagree. Do you know what that requires? It requires that our love matures and grows in those environments instead of us reverting back to our kind of our temptation to get into the us versus them. I mean, if we're not careful, when we don't see things the same way, we start talking past each other and potentially we begin to confuse a problem with the problem. Both of them are important, but when we are clear about the problem from God's perspective, from, from what Jesus came to accomplish, it helps us then set the table for how we talk about our problems that we're experiencing here. So what is the problem that Jesus resolves that broke down the wall of hostility? Let's look at the verse again. He says, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups. You could insert all people to God by means of his death on the cross. And it's that moment that allows our hostility towards each other to be put to death. When we place our faith in Christ and the work that he did, he solves the problem that sets the table for us to talk about all of our problems. What is the problem? The problem, it's sin. And sin is not just 
the mistakes that we make. Oh, shucks, I did it again. I had too much to drink this weekend. I went a little too far in that relationship. Uh, the ten com- No, sin is a spiritual condition. It's like spiritual cancer. The word literally means to be separated from God. And the separation is so far, there's nothing that you and I can do to fix the gap, to close the gap. And so Jesus himself gave his body, he died on the cross to close the gap, to deal with the punishment, to put a victory over sin, to enable us to be a part of God's family. When he dealt with that problem, he has helped pave the way for then us who have complex differences to keep that in our closed hand as we talk about all of these complicated problems and differences we have today. This is why we are convinced, I am convinced, that the church is the hope of the world. Like I'm convinced that when we introduce people to Jesus, what happens? As they place their faith in him, God's spirit begins to live inside of us and begins to change us from the inside out. It transforms the way that we think as we take steps on this life-changing adventure with him. So that's why every weekend when you are on mission with us, you're helping push back the injustices in our world by dealing with the problem first so that we can talk about our problems together. What what Jesus reminds us as we move forward on this spiritual journey is that we need to bring our pride, whenever we sense it in our life, we need to bring our pride to the cross To the cross where it puts down the hostility that demands I'm better than you, that you're worse than you really are. If the best possible human, Jesus, was condemned to the worst possible death, the cross, and he did that to reconcile us with God because we couldn't, then we need to see ourselves differently. We need to be reminded that without the grace of God, we're all in the same boat, okay? Separated and far from God. That, that means that other people may be in a different spot in their spiritual journey than you are. And so we can extend grace to them. It reminds us that no matter what our experience is, we need to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In case you've forgotten, we're not God, okay? So we're not even in the same boat as Jesus, Instead, though, he gave up his divine privilege. He gave up his rights. He gave up what was his and took on the humble position of a slave. When when I hear this, when I'm reminded of this, like every weekend when you attend or, or join us for a weekend service, you know what we're trying to remind you? What I'm trying to be reminded of is to set down our pride and to know God. And when I do that, man, I am able to listen And I am able to learn and I am able to love people better instead of being quick to react. I'm able to be quicker to listen, slower to speak, which means I'm slower to get angry. You know what what happens when I'm reminded of the cross and what God has done for me? It means when I do speak to other people, I'm reminded to speak humbly and not from a position of of power, authority, or what. I'm reminded to... Think about where other people are at in their journey and maybe the role that I'm going to play. Will Richardson, one of the parts of the video that we couldn't include, the file got corrupted. We had all sorts of fun tech issues all week, all week and weekend long. But he just said, celebrate recovery. Change the way that I see myself and the way that I see other people. It changes the way that I show up. Even the way that I approach someone or a vehicle when somebody else is breaking the law. I just remember we're all on this journey and every person needs to encounter the life-changing message of Jesus. And so every weekend at Cedar Creek, we want to remind you of that. And when you have the humility to be open to what God may want to say, he's going to help you grow in your capacity, in your your capacity to put down your pride. He's going to help you grow. He's going to help me grow in our humility so that we stop dividing over that. Each weekend, he also wants us to bring our fear to the empty tomb. The empty tomb was Jesus' exclamation point. If he would have just died for the, out of love for humanity, he would have been considered a martyr, but he's called the savior of the world because he came back from the dead. He demonstrated spiritual authority. 
He said to his disciples, there is no power, no authority. All of it's been given to me on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And so when we remember that, it gives us the courage to step into the uncomfortable. We don't have to be caught up in our fear. Instead, we can be filled with faith that the one who defeated the grave is with us and inviting us to move with him to push back the injustice and evil in our world, to step up, to speak out when someone acts in a way that's not reflective of the goodness and the grace of God. It means we, sh- we shouldn't sit here silently when we see things that don't reflect his goodness and his love in our world. Not be arrogant, but man, speak out confident, with confident humility instead of living in our silence and in our fear. Jesus also wants to help us with our hurt. He wants us to bring our hurt to God and his family. Like what happened at the cross is God it was able to forgive us of our sin. That's what Jesus' sacrifice provides. It, it brought forgiveness for the separation of the sin between us and God. But that forgiveness also can help us extend forgiveness to those who hurt us. And so instead of walling ourselves off in our hurt with people who are like us, who agree with us, instead we can say, God, help us heal. And that's why group life is so important. Because when you gather around other people and you confess hurts and sins and and even pride and fear to them, it brings Jesus into that space that helps us grow. One of the quotes that I heard this week that I appreciated (laughs) From, I think from William Walton, I don't even know who that is, but the quote was, holding onto a grudge is like being stung to death by one bee. And I think sometimes like we're holding on to these hurts like, like they're, they're our badge of honor and Jesus doesn't want us to live that way. He wants to bring healing to that so that we can love people with his love, so that we can forgive the way that he has forgiven us. So let's bring our hurt to God and let's talk about it and let's be prepared to listen and care about that when others share their hurt with us. Jesus also invites us to bring our hopelessness and to replace it with his purpose. Instead of looking around at the impossible of the situation, we can begin to have hope in the purpose that God has given us. This is why we think growth track is so important. Not that the class is great, but it gives you spiritual vision for your life. Why? Because the thief wants to steal, kill, and destroy the purpose that God has given you. Satan wants you convinced that you're just an accident, that this is random, that you can't do anything to make a difference, that it's never going to get any better, that you're a mistake. And Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. You're here on purpose for a purpose. You're not an accident. You matter to God. And when you begin to see that, when you begin to see your gifts, your past, your passions have incredible potential with God, then you can step and join in the work that God is doing. Why? Because our message to a hopeless, hurting world is this. Now, all of us, every single one of us can come to our Heavenly Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. This is what it means to introduce people to Jesus. Not some can come, not only good people, not just a certain ethnicity, all people. Sin no longer separates us from God and it should no longer separate us from each other. Yeah, yeah, God certainly sees what you and I have done, but you know where he focuses? He focuses on who you can become with him and he invites us to have that same vision when we see differences and problems all around us. We start to see people differently. Look at what he says next. He says, so now you Gentiles no longer are strangers and foreigners. So instead of us versus them, insider and outsider, here's how we're supposed to see people who are on this movement. You and I are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Like Jesus resolved the hostilities that still exist in our world so that we could become one in him, reconciling, resolving, uniting around what Jesus has accomplished us. That means we can't stay silent. This means we're not just gonna kind of push it under the rug. No, we're gonna push back against the forces of evil. I wanna see Satan fall like lightning because I'm sick and tired of the hurt and heartache pride, fear, hurt, and hopelessness has in our world. So I need you to join me. I want you to join us. Not, you know what? Let me clarify that. Don't join me. Turn your eyes to the one who gave his life for us. 
when we invite you to be a part of our mission here, it's not just the church, it's the movement of God. When we say, hey, participate with us in Serve Day or Second Saturday, or join us as we try to make a difference at the Tabernacle, our friends in Central City who are making an active difference in a way that we can't, that I can't. We can join them in the work that God is doing there. When we say, hey, go to Latin America and experience other cultures and other worlds, the reason we're inviting you to do this is to begin to get a taste of what Jesus came to do. Look at, look at what it says next. It says, together, not divided, together, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Jesus himself. And we are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. We're a multi-ethnic global movement of people looking at Jesus who gave his life for us, saying God is doing something big in our world that can finally break down the hostility that we see in our earthly minds and in our cultures. And you know what? We're not always going to get it right. But as we keep him and his mission in our closed hand, and as we unite together to push back against where Satan wants to divide, then man, we're going to see God show up in powerful ways. So it's great to talk about it. It's great to think about it, get pepped up. But now it's time to walk the walk. So is there something that Jesus is inviting you to put down today? Is there something he's saying, man, It's like, set down the pride. Set down your fear. Bring me your hurt. Replace your hopelessness. Like, let's let's see the vision. Like, the, the local church is what Jesus started. It is the hope of the world. And he said that the gates of hell can't stand in the way of what he wants to do. Not through me, but through us. You and I, you're invited to be a part of our father's house. And so let's be a part of the work that he's doing in our community. In fact, I want you to take just a couple seconds as our bands play for you to connect your heart to this incredible invitation to be a part of his incredible vision for us.